Hello everyone and welcome back to another high level match of StarCraft 2. What I've got for you today is a best of three series of Terran vs Zerg, where in game number one we find ourselves on the map Ancient Cistern. Now spawning here in the top right hand corner, playing with the blue Zerg drones, we're looking inside of the main base of Raynor and his opponent in the opposite corner with the red Terran pieces. We have none other than Gumiho. Alrighty, Raynor vs Gumiho at a best of three series. These are some of my favorite players in the entire game. So I'm hoping we've got ourselves a very fun match ahead of us as Raynor decides to open up with a spawning pool first. This is something he's been liking quite a bit over the last couple of months. And really, I guess the last couple of years. This particular series, for those of you that are paying very close attention, as you may have already noticed, it is featuring Raynor's old clan tag, his old clan decal. This particular series was played about a month and a half or so ago. So I looked it up, Raynor quite literally changed the teams the day after this particular series wrapped up. So this match, it was played during the WTL, not the easiest tournament usually to get replays from, so pretty excited to be uh, casting some of their games as well over the next couple of weeks. In case you aren't subscribed to my YouTube channel already, make sure you do so, so you get notified as soon as new videos go live. I try to post new videos pretty much every single day with the very best games of StarCraft 2 that have recently been played. And from what I understand, this series right here is a lot of fun. I haven't seen it yet, I don't know who wins, so I'm excited to find out exactly what goes down. Now, Gumiho, of course, this guy, he's a lot of fun, okay? We all know that Raynor is very good at the game, one of the very best Zerg players in the world. But Gumiho, I mean, he is certainly ranked, among, or he's certainly ranked amongst the very best Terrans, but he plays the game a little bit differently than everybody else. Now, look at this Overlord bait over here. Raynor pretending to make a mistake. Jimmy, don't do it! Jimmy, no! Look at him, dude. He's just, yeah, staring up at the sky. Didn't even see those Zerglings from his peripheral vision for a long time. Luckily for him, though, okay. The SCVs do come for the rescue. Jimmy, dude, look at that legend. Oh, well. It's still not, uh... Actually, that was... It's a single SCV, but also a little bit of lost mining. It's honestly not the end of the world right here for Gumi, but... One of those early game starts where... Raynor is just trying to show him who's boss, but... Gumi is not falling for it, as immediately on the back it is. Raynor doesn't go for Zerkling's speed. Instead, he decides to drop down a Roach Warren as well. Okay. So, with a marine opener like this, right? Obviously, this sort of Zerkling start, it could have been shut down by a, uh, well, a Reaper, right? Since these things don't have speed, there's not a whole lot they can do to contest a Reaper. But I guess as soon as Rainer realized, wait a second, there's no Reaper out at all, my opponent isn't going to be able to scout out if I go for a very quick Roach Warren and if I skip the Zerkling speed, yeah. This is certainly worth testing. So, five Roaches are coming up already after the Zerklings didn't really get that much done. Luckily for Gumi, he is sending out one scouting Hellion at this point, so at the very least, he should get a little bit of time to prepare for this. And it seems to me that he's gonna go for the big switch... Mm, okay. I wouldn't mind seeing the big switcheroo inside of the main base to go for maybe a, uh, a cheeky little Benshee. That would not be a bad start. Anyways, the Roaches right now, they do get spotted, and that is absolutely massive. This is gonna give Gumiho a little bit of time to prepare, and I don't think something like a bunker would be misplaced. Really? Are we... we're just gonna go Siege Tank and Marines? Okay. So he's looking at this. I mean, he obviously knows Terran better than me. Um, he's looking at this and he's like, nah, it's fine. In my mind, though, I mostly play Zerk, right? In my mind, bunkers are basically free. I mean, you can salvage them, worst case scenario. You get 75% of your resources back. It's like a piggy bank, right? You can always smash it in the future. Uh, but apparently, Gumiho doesn't want to go for a bunker. Which is a little bit surprising. There's a siege tank out right now, though, so I guess that'll be kind of nice. You don't really have the gas to go for too many Ravagers. Two Ravagers available, but two Ravagers is not enough to actually one-shot these siege tanks. Okay, the Hellion. The hero Hellion. It does go down eventually. This Liberator also decided to tickle away at the Overlord. And you know what? Gumi was right. <laughs> Thought for a second he was going for a bunker right now. No, he was right. He didn't really need any of this. Cancel. Okay, well. Poor SCV. So, what do we do now? Raynor has been droning behind this basically the entire time. And he's just trying to build this now into a macro game, I suppose. The main issue here for Raynor is that he doesn't have Zerkling speed, he doesn't have upgrades, he doesn't have a lair, he's lacking tech, right? So, the question is always, when do you want to start adding all of those things, well, to your base? It can be very tempting to 
take an additional gas geyser and just, you know, get all of the tech after the fact, but then you fall behind economically. I personally find that these type of games are very difficult to play. As Gumiho, though, he has been in this scenario dozens of times, right? It's a bit of a weird state to be in, but he decides to go for a siege tank drop. Of course. Not something we normally see, but hey, if there's no links to surround these siege tanks, what exactly are you gonna do? Uh, you gotta be so careful, though. Losing that medevac with the siege tanks inside of it would be an absolute disaster. Liberator still zero confirmed kills, but at the very least, it's been causing a little bit of chaos. Rainer probably uh, giggling to himself here as well, because this is not something you normally see. It doesn't really take a whole lot of damage. And honestly, so far, considering the amount of aggression we've seen in this game, the losses really have been minimal. Now, it might be worth noting as well that a week prior to this particular game, to this particular series, these two faced off at IAM Karavitsa, and Raynor ended up winning 2-0 at the time. Ooh, Siege Tank Drop does get a, a road right there at the end, okay. Anyways, so Gumiho going into this match knowing very well that Raynor is on point. And I think in, yeah, this match we already sort of see that, right, because... Gumi is very much so the kind of Terran player who will cut corners, right? Going for the Marine opener, skipping the bunker, just not getting a whole lot of scouting info. And with builds like the one that Raynor just went for, it can be really difficult to actually, yeah, go for your <laughs> conventional shenanigans, right? Raynor, at the very least so far, reading his opponent like a book. If Gumi wanted to go for any sort of cheese, it would have been very difficult to pull that off, right? With a bunch of roaches running across the map with the early game Zerklings. I mean, something like a Proxy Rex, it just wouldn't do particularly well. Third Command Center, though, is built at this point. And Gumi is going to be able to, well, transition towards a relatively normal game right now. He's known as the Mech Guy. He's known as the, the Gumi God. The Mech God. Generally speaking, that seems to be his go-to approach, but in this particular game, he is definitely playing that infantry-based army instead. So, Siege Tank Marine. Now, as I've discussed in the past, and I don't mean this as, you know, any ill intent or whatever, but Gumiho is a little bit slower than your average top-level Terran. Now, I know that some of you take uh, a little bit of an insult there, because... Oh, look, are you still playing 300-plus actions per minute? Look, the fact of the matter is that 300 actions per minute at the pro level is slow. I know it's incredibly fast for, you know, your average guy, but... I'm assuming that the average, uh, I don't know... The average uh, guy running a mile is also not particularly relevant to the guys that do so for a living, right? Like, it's it's very difficult to actually be fast. And Well, that's a couple Marines going down, exactly like I was saying. Someone like, I don't know, someone like Maru, Bjorn, Oliveira, I feel like they would be on top of those Marines ever so slightly better. Usually, though, Gumiho is very efficient with his actions. So even though he may not be the fastest Terran player out there, he is still... Yeah, very good with his actions, and therefore, he will still be uh, usually quite successful. Now, that was a little bit sloppy by Raynor. He probably assumed that there would be more Terran units over here, but a lot of those Terran units are currently occupied in the middle of the map. That's basically three medevacs full of units, and I don't think Raynor really expected to get this much work done, but... Yeah, killing a bunch of those tanks, killing a bunch of the Marines, not bad at all, especially if you can get out of here. The Biles desperately try to keep those Marines at bay, but those uh, Marines come stimming down the ramp, and they will catch a couple of those Roaches and Ravagers on the retreat. Hive coming up, together with the Baneling Nest. We still don't have... Look at the upgrade situation right here for Zerk, right? This is what makes me feel so uncomfortable when I play this way. Um, he's just got Roach Speed, he's just got plus one. We're going into two infestors, now Link Speed starts up. This kind of reminds me of the way that Dark plays the game, and I ultimately do think it's the best way to play Zerk, but... It's also... Kind of tricky, right? You play this game for a decade, you establish a standard, and then you throw it all out of the window. That's kind of what this feels like. Really lovely situation right here for Gumiho, as he catches a... A couple of those queens off guard, not bad at all. He's got very stellar upgrades here. Maybe the 2-2 could have started up a little bit quicker, but he's able to do what he feels most comfortable with right now. Double siege tank production. We've got additional barracks now also coming up inside of the main base. I mean, this is a really good situation right now for the Terran. He's got the fourth command center about to finish up. Usually on ancient cistern, Terran players like to take the base right here at the bottom, at the six o'clock. And there's not really a whole lot that the Zerg player can do about it, especially if you build a planetary fortress on top of it. Plus, Gumi is still pushing right here on the right side of the map. Yeah, catching those roaches without proper upgrades. Those roaches really can't do much. And this base certainly is going to go down. Okay. A couple of creep tumors over here also getting sniped. 
Radar, however, is going into a much better army composition here eventually. He now adds on the Ultralisk Cavern as well. He's already got Infestors. Baneling Speed is going to finish up. Link Speed is finally done. We're getting there, right? If this game goes on for another five minutes or so, Radar is going to feel a whole lot better about his uh, situation. His economy is still good. We're talking 95 drones. Maybe even a little bit better than good. Maybe even a little bit too good. At some point, uh, you just don't have enough supply available anymore for army, especially when you go for roaches. But as long as he doesn't die, he should be able to... Yeah, get to a better unit composition here eventually. So the plan is probably to not remake any roaches and just replace them with higher tier units instead. Gumiho with only 68 uh, SCVs here. I was gonna say drones, but I don't think he's got any of those. Uh, yeah, you can't really fight into this with the, the siege tanks spread as beautifully as they are. This is uh, the Terran player inviting the Zerg to go off creep, and apparently Raynor may very well be taking the invitation. I don't think he needs to go too deep. That fungal growth was pretty sweet, but the siege tank's still so far back, right? Very helpful. Will these marines be able to escape? Well, at least some of them will. The fight up north also sort of won by the Zerg, but look at the units that are replacing this. We have tons of Zerglings. Now pretty well upgraded. We've got an Ultralisk coming up as well. Still, though, that invitation off creep, it worked out quite nicely right there for Gumi. Zerk really didn't need to go off creep there. I mean, he wanted to replace his low tier units with high tier units, and I know there's maybe a little bit of irony in calling Zerklings high tier units, but with Adrenal Glands and all the upgrades, they are amazing. Significantly better than Roaches. Yeah, I don't think that move was particularly great right there for Raynor. Maybe uh, not expecting the amount of siege tanks available right there for Gumi, who's been happily producing out of double factory here for some time already. This is a tricky spot, yeah. Now the Terran is slow pushing further forward. The creep is gonna disappear here over the, uh, yeah, the next half minute or so, and it's gonna be difficult to get a proper engagement in. Raynor now, okay, sniping a couple of the reinforcements. Love that little move. And Terra needs to be careful that they don't spend too much time in this area either. Now a couple of Vipers are available too. They can throw some blinding clouds. A little bit difficult to see right here on the green map. But at the very least, a couple of the siege tanks are disabled. You gotta be so cash... Uh, so, 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 I wanna say cautious and careful at the same time. You gotta be so cautious uh, to make sure you don't sit out here off creep for too long either. Because Zerk is gonna be able to remax eventually, right? And Terra obviously... Well, they've been cut off their reinforcements for at least a little while. Getting the melee upgrade, though. Very nice. That upgrade did not finish, so these Zerklings and these Banelings and these Ultras, they're just not going to be as powerful. Based in the center of the map now also acquired, Rainer trying to set up a surround once more. That tree over here definitely going to go down, and that's the natural expansion of the Zerg. Radar, in the meantime, has been taking the entire top left and corner, and now he's got a good wraparound as well. Those additional Zerklings coming in from the bottom, fantastic. Massive fungal growth as well, slowing this down. Blinding Cloud now on top of the fungal growth too, to try and slow down the advancement of this Terran army. Siege Tank is going to pull back. Will we see a transfusion while the Queens are off creep? So I don't think that's really going to happen, but we do have a lot of Zerg armies still available. Yeah, the question is, do you really want to commit here, right? They don't have that amazing of a... Uh, an upgrade count right now. Plus two for the armor. They do have chitinous, but that's really about it. The Ultras, though, they do live for a long time. And as soon as the Ultras get on top of the bio units, you can see that they uh, you can see that they do deal a tremendous amount of damage. Terran has not finished 3-3 just yet. That's going to finish up right after this engagement. And after what seems to be like a five-minute long battle, Raynor does stabilize. The question is, at what cost? He's lost way more there than his opponent, but like I pointed out, he has been taking the top left and corner. He's got new minerals right here to mine. Maybe his natural disappeared and maybe he doesn't have a lot of creep anymore on the right side, but he still has 87 drones. He still has a stellar economy. He's got to be able to actually replenish a lot of these losses. Honestly, my main concern at this point for Raynor is the upgrade situation. I would not mind seeing a couple, uh, yeah, additional upgrades start up in the EVOs, but obviously the late game upgrades inside of those EVO chambers are also rather expensive. So maybe Raynor is opting to max out first before he decides to once again start up some of those. Liberator in the top left hand corner. I think this is the first time Gumiho finds out about this base here. No. Yeah. Don't do it, Brenda. Nah, Raynor's super fast. Not a problem. 
is going to be able to uh, step Brenda out of the zone. In the meantime, though, we do have a little bit of an er uh, circling Ultralis skirmish here. A couple Banelings now also joining in. So Terran, here's my problem, right? The Terran here is fully upgraded when it comes to their bio. We have ghosts added into the mix right now as well. Gumiho's army is getting better. <sighs> Raynor is, I think, a little concerned about the situation that he's in, and he decides to not continue upgrading. But I don't really see how he's going to be able to win this game if he doesn't at the very least match the upgrades right here of the Terran. Unless he can get like one banger of an engagement, maybe Fungo in the middle of this entire Terran bio ball, right? Then suddenly there's a chance, but this is going to be dangerous, man. These are, these are Zerklings and Ultras and Banelings that will just die a little bit quicker. Now we see the additional upgrades starting up. Okay. It's going to be a couple minutes, but eventually the upgrade should stabilize if this game goes on long enough. Okay, now the fight is on creep though, and that is a whole lot better. There's also an Infestor available. We have a Transfusion right there on the Ultralisk. Love that. The bio drop continues in the natural. This base over here, I don't think that one's gonna happen, Rainer, but that's almost bait, right? Trying to just tell the opponent, yo, this is this is my expansion now. You can take the bottom right in corner, but I'm gonna take top left. Kill on that base though. 300 minerals down the drain, plus the cost of the drone. Lovely spread right here by Gumi, man. This is something that the top tier Terrans have been very fond of, and once again, the invitation off creep is accepted. I don't think you should take these fights, but I mean, do you really have a choice? Fungal growth? Okay, at least that one's going down before the Infestor itself does. Brilliant game right here by Gumi. We're doing a really good job. He needs to step up the macro, though, because he's got a ton of money in the bank. He really should be able to remax here immediately. He's certainly not producing out of all of his barracks at this point. He should have at least eight. Yeah, I think he should, uh... uh maybe he is. Uh, the ghosts, I guess, take up a lot of slots here. Anyways, he certainly should try and step on the macro a little bit more, because you want to make sure that you get that tempo, right? Now, one way in which you get the tempo lead, though, is by continuously denying those bases on the outside, and then also making sure that the creep doesn't get respread. There's one, well, very ambitious tumor going through the center of the map, but the middle here on the right side have been denied continuously. Another scan over here would be really nice. There it is. Making sure that the creep does not connect those bases. It puts Zerk in these very uncomfortable positions. A couple of ghosts available as well. Yeah, there you go. Bullseye right there on the Ultra. Excellent. Historically speaking, back in the early days when Rainer first came up, he lacked a little bit of patience. That's the main thing we could criticize him for back in like, I want to say like 2018 or so. Uh, maybe maybe a little bit earlier than that even. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but that's because, you know, he was very young. <laughs> he, was, he was just a kid, basically. Um, so, he, he's gotten a lot better at that over the years. But I feel like someone like Dark, maybe someone like Sarah, probably would have been a little bit more patient with some of those engagements off creep. It's hard to criticize somebody this good at the game, but I do think that's probably been the main error here so far, Raynor. Yeah, he needs to now commit, right? He needs to crush this Terran army, and that's what he's hoping for. The splits, though, once again, very stellar. The green map hiding the, uh, the blinding cloud. The ghosts at the very least stay alive, and you know what? He may not have the highest APM, but he, he's doing a phenomenal job controlling the units that he's got. Raynor's been up with his back against the wall for the better part of this game. Oh, oh, this around over here is really nice, though. No Metavex available to really uh, push back. Yeah, you know what? Sometimes just pure Zerkling may be able to finish the job. Ultra right there gets on top of the Siege Tank, too. He's now going to start working on the Ghosts. A lot of very expensive units have just gone down right here on the side of the Terror, and that's honestly the very first victory that we've seen the Zerk player have in quite a while. Okay. I didn't think we were going to get there anymore in this game, but Rainer actually just pushed it back. I think a lot of that, though, is due to the fact that Gumiho hasn't been macroing as cleanly as we might want to see. He's got a lot of money in the bank. He's lacking a little bit of gas. Yeah. This would make this uh, a little bit more difficult, I think. Gumiho once again showing up before the creep really gets uh, out of control once again, and now with the Metavex having some energy once more, too. He's going to be able to heal these units up as they are fighting. And Ultralis pops out of a cocoon, desperately runs away, and will be able to get to safety, but... The base in the center of the map goes down. Base on the right side of the map. Okay. 
<laughs> very ambitious SCV, trying its very best. But I think there's enough, right? I think there has to be enough. Well, I mean, he took a lot of damage just now from a couple of Bane Links. But Gumiho does obtain the victory in game number one. I'm a little tired just from commentating the game. I can't imagine playing it. it must have been <laughs> very exhausting. These guys obviously uh, yeah, fighting for what seemed to be like 80% of that match, right? It always is interesting to me when I think back and sometimes I watch VODs of the early days of StarCraft 2. In case you didn't watch back in Wings of Liberty, oftentimes basically the games were decided by two guys sitting back for the better part of 20 minutes and then eventually they clashed once. That was the whole game. They would clash once and everybody would be like, oh my god, this is the best game ever. And then the Brute War guys that used to watch Brute War religiously back in the day, they were like, yo, StarCraft 2 is horrible compared to StarCraft 1. What are you guys on about? Um, I didn't really play Brute War. I looked at the graphics. I was like, eh, I think I'm going to stick with StarCraft 2. And I'm very glad I did. But there's no denying that the quality of the games has gotten a whole lot better over the years. We started off years ago with just one single clash between two massive armies to decide who wins the game. And, well, these days we have battles going on for, well, literally like 80% of that game. These guys were fighting the entire time. Anyways, a bit of a normal build here. At the very least from the Zerg player this time around, who's opting to go for a hatchery into a gas geyser and then a spawning pool. In the meantime, on the other side of the map, Gumiho has decided to go for a command center first. Altitude, though, a massive map, as we've already seen a couple of days ago in a previous Zerg vs. Terran, where a Terran player, may have actually been Gumi as well. I think it was actually Gumi. Anyways, um, a Terran player decided to go for a commence on first on Altitude. The Zerg opened up with a, uh, a spawning pool very quickly. A couple Zerglings ran across the map, but by the time that the Zerglings finally made it across, the orbital command was already, like, halfway done. This map is so big that if you want to shut down a CC first, you're really going to have to commit hard. Now, if this map is in a map pool for another half year or so, I wouldn't be surprised if Zerg players decide to go for some very cheesy builds. You can go for proxy hatcheries, you can go for a Roach Ravager push off of one base. There are build orders out there that do counter this sort of shenanigans, but you have to commit really hard. And obviously, if you commit really hard to, say, like a, a one base Roach Ravager, right? So the double gas really quickly, super quick Roach Varn. Um, you just lose to, like, a standard opener where Terran goes barracks into command center, so... We might be playing the build order game, but not just yet. Yeah, so Gumi is actually checking it out, look at that. So, I'm saying maybe in half a year time, but Gumiho is checking for proxy hatches. Which is kind of ironic. Alright. Not happening in this game. What we do have happening is another very interesting move. Raynor leaving the drones in gas, skipping the link speed first, and decides to start up Nomatize Carapace as his very first upgrade. So that is the Overlord Speed upgrade. I guess he now knows, okay, my opponent went for a CC first. I won't need Zerkling Speed super quickly. If I don't need Zerkling Speed super quickly, I may as well go for the very quick Overlord Speed so I can scout out exactly what my opponent is doing. So I think this guy over here is just about to become a Formula 1 car. He should be able to go straight through the Terran's main base. Yeah, there it is. And he's going to be able to scout out exactly what's happening. Now, this is always nice, right? The main downside of going for quick Overlord speed is that sometimes you put your resources into Overlord speed and you rather wanted to spend those resources on army instead. There's a very awkward moment when you're playing a game of Zerg sometimes where you know exactly what's coming. I guess this goes not necessarily just for Zerg, but usually Zerg is a more defensive race. But you know exactly what's coming, you've scouted it perfectly, and then you realize, wait a second, I've just spent so many resources on scouting it perfectly that I don't have resources to actually defend. Whereas if you don't go for the Nevertized Carapace, you don't go for the scout, you, well, would have had a couple more units out at the very least. Anyways, in this game, that's not particularly relevant. Gumi is going for the Cloak upgrade here inside of the tech lab while also making a Viking, which makes me think that he wants to push back that Overlord and then cancel the Cloak. Although this is Gumi how we're talking about. This guy sometimes plays 4D chess. Yeah, he does still start up a Benshee. So this OV is certainly not going to live. But are we going to commit? Are we going to keep this? Oh, you know what? He decides to cancel another of the two upgrades and now transitions towards mech. Okay, that's kind of cute. Burrow? Ooh, okay. I was going to say, that is not the upgrade we need. Canceled it immediately. 
Um, Gumiho trying to sell the story of him playing Bio Terran once again, but he's making a transition towards Terran Mech. As soon as that Overlord was gone, we had a double factory added into the mix. Now, normally, yeah, we should have a follow-up scout as well. So this is mostly to confirm that what you scouted earlier is indeed what you are actually playing against. Honestly, it shouldn't really matter all too much. It's not like Zerg players hate playing Banelinks against Terran Bio or Terran Mech. It doesn't really matter all too much. But, you know, it's a nice little mind game, right? This Overlord is going to get sacrificed as well for the greater good. Raynor is going to see what he's playing against. So he saw the green light right over there inside of the tech lab. Probably anticipated it being Stimpak, but... Well, now he does. Now he knows. Spore crawlers immediately start up. Hyperflight Rotors also researching here for Gumi. So Gumi is going to be playing some good old battle mech, I would imagine. Okay. Now, this is a very slow battle mech, though, right? I mean, we're talking six minutes into this game. Raynor has been essentially able to do whatever he likes. He's got full three base saturation pretty much already. He's going for a fourth hatchery right now. The creep spread is looking dangerous. Yeah, and, you know, even though killing a couple creep tumors over here is nice, there's already a little bit of that creep underwater. You think it gets slippery underwater? I don't know, man. I'm not entirely sure anyways if the, the creep is, is slippery in the first place. It kind of looks like it. The Zerg units do move faster on creep, of course. But then if it's underwater as well, does it become... <laughs> full slip and slide over here, man. You come cruising down the ramp. Suddenly the Zerglings look like they're wearing ice skates. You love to see it. Anyways, battle mech indeed. Raynor has decided that even though he knows this is indeed mech, that he's going to be playing Mutaling Bane. So this is about to become a very interesting match. Mutaling Bane historically played exclusively against Terran Bio, but it's actually pretty damn good against, well, at least vanilla mech. I'm not exactly sure how this is going to play out against battle mech right now. I mean, Terran does, of course, well, not know what they're playing against right now. And sometimes a dozen or so mutas can certainly catch you off guard, but these Hellions are putting in a lot of work. I wonder what would have happened here if he decided to go for the Infernal Pre-Igniter upgrade first, because he decided to go for a couple different upgrades. Yeah, with Blue Flame, these Hellions would have destroyed everything. They've still sort of destroyed everything, I suppose, but... The most important thing right here for, for Raynor is that he's got the Spire done, and he has not been scouted whatsoever. He's got a couple Larva, he's got Overlords available, there we go. Ten Mutas do indeed start up. Okay. So what units right here for the Terran actually do shoot up? Cyclones? Cyclones are pretty dang good, but also quite expensive. That Viking? That one's also available. I would imagine that as soon as Gumiho scouts this, he's gonna transition towards Thors? But there is a chance he's gonna stick around and double down on Cyclone production instead. The Gumi God is the only Terran player that's been playing this sort of style for years, and... Well, I'm thinking, okay, yeah, Thors is what you need against Mutas? He might disagree. There's no static defense, at least over in the third base, so this base is very susceptible to damage. And I think those Mutas are gonna find it as well. Yep. In the meantime, though, this does mean that the Hellions and the... Uh, well, the Hellbats right now and the Cyclones can start dealing some damage here too. But uh, maybe if the Benchies can shut down the base on the left, this can't be justified right here for the Terran. Terran does need to kill that base, though, in order for this to be okay. He does indeed double down on the Cyclone production. I, I kind of figured that he would do something like that. Anyways, 10 SCVs have gone down so far, 2 drones have gone down, the hatchery has gone down, plus, these Benchies actually denying this expansion up here is huge. That now means that Raynor's got 83 drones on just 3 bases, which means he's heavily oversaturated, yeah. He needs another base to actually mine, so in the end, this works out really nicely right here for Gumiho. Those drones are still alive, so you don't want to overestimate your advantage, but this is certainly what you're looking for. Mutas are going to try and chase back those Benchies, but with the speed upgrade on them, well, they're going to be able to get on out of there pretty easily. This base actually got the Knight another time as well. Now Raynor's best chance, I guess, is to double expend, but it's going to be several minutes until his economy is once again back in action. It's okay for now, but the fourth command center is just landed. I'm assuming this will be a planetary fortress. Yeah, despite the fact that Mutaling Bane... Oh my god, huge lock-on! Despite the fact that normally Mutaling Bane is the army that grabs map control, Gumiho has decided, no, you wanna, you wanna play this game? Sure, I'll play this game. 
I don't think a lot of Terran players are confident playing this style against uh, Mutaling Bane, but Gumiho feeling good. He's even leaving a couple Hellbats on hold position here. That's brilliant because he knows that there's a chance for a Zerkling wraparound. Right now, ooh, he's actually zoned away this all very nicely. The attack move right there on the Zerklings. It's not what you're looking, man. No, it's not what you're looking for at all. You wanted to go after those Cyclones with the Lynx, but the Cyclones, they have maneuvered their way around. Benshee's right over here on the left side of the map. Shut down that base once again. Gumiho playing a fantastic game of Terran here. The Muta count is honestly not as impressive either, right? You kind of want to have overwhelming numbers. Yeah, there's about as many Mutas as there are Cyclones right now, which I think is exactly what the Terran player is looking for. Fourth Command Center finally morphing into Planetary Fortress. I think in a normal game, if Raynor didn't lose so many hatcheries, he would have certainly sent in some Zorklings there, but he hasn't really had the chance. Okay. So, what do we do now, Gumi? I'm still a little scared that he is sticking around in this unit composition for so long. Usually there is a moment where you decide, okay, enough battle mech, I've now got economy to start making siege tanks and thors and maybe some hell bats, but mostly just those really heavy hitters. He instead decides to double down, man. He adds on three additional factories right now. I think Gumiho is planning on winning a game with this incredibly mobile army. Yeah, he's going for the throat right now. He wants to win the game by going into the Zerg's natural in the main base. Now the Mutas do show up though. They have well upgraded, uh, well, damage here. A couple of the Zerglings get the wraparound. Yeah, I, I was gonna say this. It's easy to overestimate your advantage when there are still that many drones available, right? Like, I mean, he did kill a lot of workers over the last couple minutes, don't get me wrong, and it's been really good to see, but... I think the time for the... the yeah, the Cyclone Hellion style may very well have ended. I think it ended a couple minutes ago. I think he overextended a little bit. Now we do have Siege Tanks coming up. He's going into 2-2. Two, two. 33 drones have been killed here in total, but the Muta count is still looking good. Yeah. Uh, this could actually get very dicey right now for Gumi, because Gumiho doesn't have an answer. He doesn't have an answer for, well, 20 Mutalisks. He can keep the Zerg player at bay, so he can keep them occupied, but if he catches those... Ooh, if he would have caught those Benchies, that would have been huge. Okay, well, the Mutas are going to return right now. Question is, are they going to be able to save the hatchery? I think they will. But losing these Benchies, that is going to shut down the map control of the Terran player entirely. A couple of the Benchies did split off from the pack. Yeah, I do kind of like that. Trying to at least save as many of them as possible. That Benchie right now returning back home again as well. But we're going up to 20-something Mutas here, and that is a dangerous army all in on its own, right? Even if you do go for Thors, that's not a guaranteed counter. Gumiho, though, running circles around his opponent so far. I mean, we should really see a split right here on the Mutas as well as a second Overseer, but... Ay -ay 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 -ay. Well, we can see once again that APM is not everything. <laughs> Gumiho is playing like such a jerk, man. This is... <laughs> this has to be the... My god, this has to be the worst... The worst army to play against. Look how fast the bench he is! Yeah, now we have a second Overseer. Zerk has been... Zerk has been assuming, right? They grabbed the map control as soon as the Mutas... Well, joined the battlefield. As soon as the Mutas were out, that really was the moment where Raynor was supposed to grab the map control. We're talking like at the 8 minute mark or so. It's been a long time. Gumiho just continues driving around. He still doesn't have a great answer against Demutas, but apparently he is just gonna put down the pressure even more so than he already has. Yeah, and Raynor actually a little bit scared right now. He doesn't know how many Cyclones there are. He doesn't have vision. That hatchery once again falls. Benshi once more shows up here up north. These Benchies have been so annoying, my god. I wish I could see the amount of damage that the Benchies have done just by themselves. If you look right now at the resources lost, yeah, this has been fantastic right here for Gumiho. Losing maybe a couple too many minerals for his liking, but I mean, that's mostly just those Hellions and Hellbats. Here we have the drive backwards, those Mutas, man, they try their best to engage. Now the Cyclone Lock-On, though, is on cooldown, and they can't really get that much damage him, but it's once again available. With the new multiplayer balance patch, they are good against everything. They used to be good primarily against Armored, but you can see the minimap blinking. The Terran player is still everywhere. 
Gumiho just obtained the victory by simply outplaying Raynor. Honestly, brilliant play.